Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody here in this beautiful auditorium at Fias. And welcome online for those of you who are on different platforms. Welcome to the event today. The event being that we're going to listen to an exciting lecture by Carla Tart, How Does Extreme Weather Impact Coastal Ecosystem? I want to say this is the first of back to business of post pandemic uh, lecture we have in Fias. I'm very happy that we start being here again. <laughs> I hope the audience will pick up, for those of you who are sitting at home, uh, we are probably about, what are we, 20, 30 people here or something like that. Good. Um, but I'd like to introduce Carl. Carl is from Malta, or Malta, uh, <laughs> but did most of his undergraduate work in UK, more specifically at SAMS, Scottish Association for Marine Science, um, and he's finished his bachelor there in 2010. After that, he's made a PhD uh, in sort of four plus four arrangement here at SDU, where he uh, worked in particular with a new technique called aggregated covariance, which I'm sure we're going to hear more about here, exploring the importance of coastal, different coastal habitats for carbon cycling and primary production. It was a very rich thesis, a very impressive thesis, with many good highlights, and well, I was mainly taken, I'm um, most impressed by a very elaborate seasonal study of the uh, end primal production in short work, cars take from more than a year in Korea. After the PhD 2015, uh, Carl had a number of postdoc stays, partly at the University of Helsinki and partly at SDU, further exploring the ideas and the vision he developed during his PhD, looking more and more into what is the importance of biodiversity for element cycling and carbon cycling in the coastal realm, but also what is the importance of events, events in the form of meteorological events or other type of events that may change the function and the biochemical function and biological function of coastal ecosystems. Events that very often are overlooked or ignored when we are trying to understand the importance of the coastal ocean for, for instance, filtering carbon and nitrogen from land to the deep ocean. Sure, we're going to hear more about that. Um, uh, Carl's work has been very innovative. It's been absolutely on the forefront. I think it's fair to say that Carl is at the international forefront now within his research area. Um, it's, there's a lot of interest for the kind of work that he's doing. Um, so <coughs> proud to have collaborated <laughs> with Carl on this. I've known Carl since he as an eager young student, <laughs> undergrad student, to a mature scientist is today, so it's been great to see you evolve and uh, to collaborate with you in that time. I hope we will continue to have for, for the coming years. Um, yeah, and I'm sure you will appreciate works, Carl's work and visions to after the talk today. So please, Carl. Thanks so much, Ronnie. That's really generous. Um, yeah, and I have to say, first of all, uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. So nice to see people from the broader department as well and um, the people listening on YouTube, hopefully watching as well. Um, I should say, first of all, that this talk is as much a description of my planned work as it is sort of a pitch to my uh, colleagues, particularly at Diaz, uh, to think a little bit about how extreme weather events might manifest in their areas of research as well, and to, to hopefully uh, stimulate uh, collaboration over the, the coming years. So my talk is going to be um, primarily about extreme weather and how it uh, impacts uh, coastal ecosystems. But it also takes a broader view towards um, extreme weather. And in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, what extreme weather events could be, why we should focus on extreme weather. And in my research, I also had thought about, you know, does, does global warming increase extreme weather at all? And then I'll move to the oceans, uh, where I'll, where I'll uh, give some ex examples of how extreme weather manifests in the oceans. And I'll end with uh, my vision for my position over here, which looks at uh, trying to obtain a systems level understanding of uh, coastal impacts. So we are no, um, it, extreme weather events are uh, common here as well in Denmark. It's not just something that happens um, far away in, in, in tornadoes in the US, but we often see um, 
you know, floods, uh, storms and hurricanes, and particularly droughts, often leading to wildfires. So, and these seem to be becoming more common. This is a study on marine heat waves where they looked at three different um, heat waves, one in Western Australia, another one in the Mediterranean, and one in the Northwest Atlantic. So first of all, heat waves are not only a thing that happen on land, right? Uh, the, the ocean absorbs a lot of this heat. But one question is, how do we define extreme events? And heat waves is one example of an extreme event. So if you look at the bottom uh, three panels, you will see a blue line, which is the climatology. And herein lies what I think is the first challenge, that we need to define baselines. And these exist in some areas, but not in many parts of the ocean. So extreme events are defined relative to a baseline period, which we call the climatology. And it's, so it's specific to a particular time of the year. We define uh, extreme events in terms of the intensity, so how much they surpass that uh, climatology and its variance and the spatial extent that it um, affects. And one interesting thing that emerges from this description is that naturally extreme events and uh, heat waves are not only limited to warmer months. We often think of heat waves as being something that happens in summer, for instance. But these could, you could easily have um, you know, heat waves, uh, warm events in winter or cold spells in spring. So a lot of the debate on climate change focuses on averages. You know, we often hear about average global temperature anomalies or average global sea level rise. And I think this is a useful uh, framework for defining overall uh, changes happening on the planet. However, no one place experiences its average, right? That's a de definition of, average, of, of an average. Um, and the variations around that average are, you know, what many people argue are what is actually important for how ecosystems and, and societies uh, function. So one uh, compelling example, I think, on extreme weather and its multifaceted impacts is um, the, the country of Mozambique in southeast Africa which has had strong economic growth over the past 20 years. It's seen decreases in poverty and um, increases in education and healthcare. However, unfortunately, the country has high levels and exposure, uh, high levels of exposure and vulnerability to extreme weather. And following several um, extreme weather events, uh, we, we've seen that this triggers vicious cycles um, so children are less likely to attend school because they need to be sent to work. Uh, child illnesses increased, um, acid holdings decreased, and household consumption fell uh, because of crop failures and, and uh, food price volatility. So we can see that um, extreme weather events have really multifaceted uh, long-term impacts on communities. There, is, there are more and more arguments uh, uh, that are being put forth that extreme weather events are not being um, included in sustainable development strategies. So we see that a lot of countries are adopting the sustainable development goals, for instance. But there is hardly any mention, if you, if you look into these, about the impact of um, extreme weather. In particular, there is no analysis of its ramifications of increased um, events and people are suggesting and scientists are suggesting in particular that they could this could have a domino effect on the sustainable development goals because these are simply not being um, accounted for so one of the questions i had was whether um, does global warming increase extreme weather and i think one of the more uh, compelling explanations i found was this uh, the relation the clausius clapeyron equation which is based on the laws of thermodynamics and it explains the saturation uh, vapor pressure, so the moisture content of the atmosphere, and how that changes with uh, an increase in temperature. And what we can see is that there's, a, on average, a 7 to 8% increase in saturation vapor pressure for every degree rise in temperature. The links to extreme weather uh, could be quite uh, clear. So as the water holding capacity of the atmosphere increases, this produces heavier rains, re releases more uh, latent heat, which causes more violent weather, 
and the atmosphere takes longer to, to recharge, which, which uh, creates increased drought. So until some years ago, this was mostly the understanding of how global warming um, increases extreme weather. And we're probably familiar with seeing, you know, the, the, the token scientist on daytime TV uh, being asked, you know, was this storm in particular created by global warming? Oh, we don't know, but we expect that this sort of uh, weather might, uh, this, this might be the case. But more recently, there's been a movement, there's been a new uh, part of um, a new th theme in science uh, that's called climate attribution that seems to take, to take apart all the different uh, forcing factors on specific events. And what these um, scientists have uh, done is they've created a pipeline where they can target a specific event and then um, using the best meteorological data and, and models, piece, piece apart all the different forcing factors and ultimately make a formal attribution statement about uh, the effects of anthropogenic climate change on that uh, particular event. And these, these uh, studies, these case studies, are compiled and published every year in the American Bullet, uh, Meteorological Society bulletin. And um, one case study, for instance, uh, is this one about forest fires in, in the US, where they calculated over time that this, the area burned increased uh, by, well, it has doubled due to climate change. And there are many of these case studies um, illustrating different uh, particular events. So one of the really complicated things, what complicates the story even more, is the issue of compound events. So this is a photo from, of one of our neighbors. Uh, we live on the fjord. And this is a, a, a flood event, right? A, a storm surge. And compound events are basically the, the, the product of two or more moderate events that are not by and of themselves um, extreme, but when they combine, they have these extreme impacts. So in this case, there is usually strong onshore winds uh, combined with high tides, which creates flooding and uh, creates flood damage. So in other words, ex events don't have to be extreme to have an impact. So when it, when it comes to the oceans, we also see, uh, naturally see extreme events. Storms are one example of this. And in the picture to the right, you can see that after a storm, a lot of, um, in this case, aquatic plants get washed up on shore. So these get eroded from, from their habitat underwater and get uh, forced onto the shore. So sea water is almost a thousand times uh, denser than air. So moving currents and waves carry massive kinetic energy that dislodge these biotic communities and resuspend sediments. Storms also dramatically enhance ocean connectivity. This is an interesting case study from, from Antarctica where researchers collected uh, fragments of kelp and then uh, using genomics, genomics analysis re revealed that these, these fragments of kelp actually belonged to mid-latitude uh, populations and had traveled more than 20,000 kilometers to reach the Antarctic Peninsula. Importantly, what this shows is the dual role of storms. So storms can erode the canopies themselves, but they can also, um, through the action of waves and currents, traverse ocean front barriers. Um, Antarctica has long been considered sort of ecologically isolated, but uh, storms can help sort of uh, facilitate the movement of, you know, carbon and nutrients associated with these, but also the biotic communities. I think a, a really interesting aspect to, to storms is the, the impact they have on resuspension. Uh, so sediments that, that um, settle on the seafloor and accumulate um, through the action of waves and currents get resuspended uh, up into the water column. Sediments play a really important role in the sequestration of carbon and in nutrient cycling. And um, because oxygen is used up very quickly in the surface sediments, it penetrates only the top few millimeters. Most of the carbon stored in the sediments is actually stored under anoxic conditions. 
which makes it harder to break down certain molecules of carbon back to CO2. So that's sort of a one, one aspect of the sequestration. But we often see when there are storms that storms can resuspend at least 10 millimeters, maybe even more, of the top sediments. So this re-exposes these molecules to oxygen, potentially uh, favoring their, their breakdown back to CO2. So another type of extreme event in the ocean, as I've hinted to before, are heat waves. Seawater has almost 3,000 times larger volumetric heat capacity than air. So while it takes longer for the ocean to heat up, it also takes longer for it to cool. So it could prolong um, ocean warm events. The, uh, the map that you see are of some recent heat waves over the past 20 years, particularly notable ones, that have been linked to uh, specific ecological disturbances, such as coral bleaching, for instance. Um, we've all seen, probably all seen the documentary Chasing Coral on Netflix. Uh, to, for instance, uh, fishery disruptions, um, suppressed coastal productivity, and so forth. One of the recent climate attribution studies looked at um, marine heat waves, so the most impactful marine heat waves. And what they found is that they've increased more than 20 fold in recent years um, as a result of anthropogenic climate change. So to the left, uh, you can see the three graphs that show the duration of the events, uh, the peak temperature anomaly, and the cumulative intensity, which is, which is a function of those two plus the area that they affect. And what they suggest is that these rare and, and impactful marine heat waves could become annual to decadal events. So this is clearly a dynamic that we need, we, we need to try to resolve. We, we need to try to have the tools to understand these ecological implications um, and to deduce its effects on key uh, cycles in the ocean. So an another um, study captured the effects of, of a heat wave, this time in, in, Western, in Australia. You can see the three uh, graphs to the left, where um, one of the images was taken in 2002 and another one in 2014. And in black, you can see the estimated area of seagrass. This is one of the largest and most productive seagrass beds. And in the third uh, graph, you can actually see in red the area that was eroded away due to a heat wave. Um, so these, these habitats form over thousands of years. And in one event, there was you know, more than a third of this habitat that was, that was damaged. And it doesn't take uh, much imagination to think that these sort of ecological disturbances uh, create positive feedbacks with climate change. So we've seen how the atmospheric water holding capacity increases, causing more, uh, extreme weather, which cause ecological disturbances, which release more CO2, which creates more uh, global warming. One of the really interesting aspects, I think, that, that I'm particularly uh, fascinated about is, it, is the impact of weather events on the base of aquatic food webs. So these are two studies, one focusing on microalgae, so the microscopic algae living in the, in the surface of the sediments, and the other focusing on macroalgae, so these, these larger seaweeds that form these lar uh, extensive canopies. And what these uh, studies show, if you look to the bottom two panels, is that they, they show how key metabolic processes change with increases in temperature. In this case, photosynthesis and respiration. And what we can see in both cases is that the rate at which respiration increases with temperature is faster than the rate that photosynthesis increases, or in some cases, photosynthesis might decrease with temperature as well. And at a certain point, we actually see the two lines cross, and, and so respiration actually becomes lar larger than photosynthesis. And what that means is essentially that the amount of organic matter being uh, synthesized through photosynthesis is less than that being consumed by respiration. So there's a negative uh, net uh, primary production. One of the really interesting things, I think, as well, is that benthic communities seem to be more affected by temperature, by rising temperature than individual species, meaning that if we take an individual species and expose it to rising temperatures, um, the response of that species is not necessarily indicative of that of the habitat as a whole. 
So this is an illustration of um, uh, kelp forest to the far left that's taking up CO2 and uh, fi fixing biomass, creating these, these large forests. And all the arrows you can see are different carbon flow pathways. So this is all the connectivity within the ocean. And you can see that a habitat that's in the shallows actually fuels ecosystems down to the deepest oceanic depths. The uh, illustration to the right is just the same image, but with numbers on it. And what we can see at the base of all of these uh, carbon flow pathways is the NPP, the net primary production. So that's the amount of organic matter that there is. Um, it's the very foundation, the base of, of all of these uh, carbon flow pathways. And that number determines how much, um, well, all the subsequent carbon flows, including um, the amount of, of carbon that can be sequestered. So one of the really interesting questions, I think, is to try to get better, a better handle of this NPP value, which I think is, is, is fairly uh, poorly constrained, in my view. Um, and especially when we throw in to the balance, you know, the impact of extreme weather events, um, I think this, this, is, this is a really sort of uh, compelling uh, research frontier. So in my work, I'd like to take a systems level approach to studying coastal impacts. When I think of coastal zones, I think about the variety of life. Um, I think about how um, macrophytes such as seagrasses stabilize sediments and sequester carbon. And I also think about how these uh, habitats sustain fisheries. Around 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. Um, so there's going to be, a, and naturally the population is increasing, so there's a growing demand on this relatively narrow uh, area, region of the ocean. In my previous slides, I talked about how um, extreme weather events impact coastal biodiversity, um, how it impacts the metabolic balance, the metabolic status, sorry, so the balance between photosynthesis and respiration and also how it impacts the carbon and nutrient flow pathways. And I think we need to focus on all of these areas to try and to get an understanding, uh, particularly of how extreme weather impacts um, coastal ecosystems. I think one exciting avenue is um, using both aerial and surface drones. One of the big questions is simply the extent of these habitats. We don't really know. They're underwater. They're diff they're basically uh, almost impossible uh, to see. So we need these sort of techniques. Um, and what you can do with these, with, the, with, this, with these technologies is run repeat surveys, as we can see there at the bottom left, along pre-programmed tracks. And we can do that over time as well to see how habitats change. And then we can classify uh, the habitats and de determine the extent based on either RBG or, or hyperspectral signals. This development in, dro in uh, drone technology happened in parallel with, with uh, advances in computational techniques, such as machine learning and deep learning, that really uh, aid with classification. Perhaps the aspect of this work that I'm excited about the most is trying to figure out the metabolic balance of these habitats and how they're impacted by, uh, by extreme weather. One of the key challenges is to obtain continuous measurements. So most of what we understand about these habitats, about the metabolic balance of these habitats, is based on sort of short-term and um, invasive techniques. My idea is to de develop these coastal observatories based on uh, eddy covariance technology, where we can have these small modular uh, observatories in the water, on the seafloor, hopefully year-round, to try and capture some of the effects of some of these sporadic events. I think in parallel with that, there's also great scope to do a series of laboratory experiments under controlled conditions, because it can be difficult to disentangle all the different uh, parts of this. And one, I think, uh, exciting avenue are these incubation chambers that we've developed recently, uh, together, together, of course, with the help of the mechanical um, electrical engineering workshops here at SDU. 
And what we can do is we can re recreate these extreme events under controlled conditions and um, really look at the effects of maybe single events, maybe compound events, and how that impacts the carbon cycle and the nutrient cycles. In parallel with this, we're also developing new sensor technologies to be able to perform continuous carbon and nutrient measurements. Um, this seems uh, kind of uh, trivial in a way, but it's, it's, it's actually, you know, we're, we're challenged to even measure uh, things in the ocean at the uh, resolution and frequency that we would like to. Naturally, um, I think all of these different data types and data streams um, come with a challenge. And so naturally we want to extract all of the knowledge from, from these diverse data sets. And here I think uh, using an online platform for storage, analysis, visualization, reanalysis, archiving, all those really important things um, that you need to consider when you have big data sets becomes really important. And here I think we can learn from, from uh, atmospheric uh, eddy covariance communities and other uh, terrestrial uh, research communities that have been sort of uh, implementing these sort of uh, frameworks more and more. So I think this is, this is my overall uh, project structure where I'd like to have these work packages, uh, the observatory measurements, the habitat surveys, the laboratory experiments, all informing on the research question, uh, the individual research questions to try to get to the overall question, which is to understand the impacts of extreme weather on coastal ecosystems. I think this is the right place to do it. I think um, being at SDU is, 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 the, uh, is, is the right place to be. Um, apart from the fact that Denmark have a history of both meteorological and oceanographic measurements that can help to establish baselines, um, we also have naturally state-of-the-art state laboratories and research facilities here at SDU, particularly in the Nordsy group. And um, I look forward to developing sort of new technologies with the new Hadel Center and to uh, work closely with the mechanical workshop to, to design and uh, construct equipment with them. And apart from that, there are obviously other, other groups that are really relevant to this work. Uh, the ecology group, for instance, who, who have been doing extensive habitat monitoring, mapping, and restoration. And I think the eScience Center has a role to play as well when we think about how to store and uh, analyze the data sets. So this is really my vision, but I realize that um, you know, extreme weather events can manifest in many parts of society. And I said as, at, at the start that it's not uh, only about um, my research, but I really want um, at my colleagues at, at Diaz in particular to, to participate. Um, just looking around quickly, you know, uh, you can see that extreme weather features in many aspects of society. And I think it would be really fun and uh, very stimulating to work together with um, all, all of you on, on this, this problem. Thank you for joining. I think it's time for questions now. <laughs> Hi, Carl. Uh, thank Marina. you for a very exciting uh, talk. Um, now I've been working also <laughs> with the uh, coastal uh, areas for for a while, and and <laughs> often, you know, the extreme events they always prevented us from getting out to the field, uh, but. Uh, um, you are going out there when the extreme events are coming and you don't really know when they are there. And so, so how, what, is, uh, what kind of approach do you take uh, towards the, the extreme weather? Yeah, I think, I think the key is really to have these long-term measurements, which is something we don't have. So basically having instruments in the water, naturally it is a bit of a risk uh, to have your instruments there, but um, I think this is really what, what we, need. we need. We need to have this. Um, we need to have measurements spanning, you know, at least several weeks, I think, to be able to, to capture these events. So that's really the aim. So almost flipping it around a little bit instead of staying home when the weather is bad, you know, being a 
excited about it and thinking, you know, that there might be some new insights to gain from, um, yeah, being out there. And it's not necessarily being out there, but having equipment there, right? Yeah, there's a there's a question from Kuhn. We need to for the YouTube for the YouTube channel. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> great, great talk, Carl. Really cool. Thank you, Kun. So you've been really focusing on sort of the the warm events, right? So there's also going to be extremes on the other end, so colder events. And I guess their metabolo metabolics, like it's not so warm because we'll just slow things down. But is there also extremes where it's known that those are actually very bad? You're right. Yeah, you're totally you're 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 totally right. And I didn't really talk about that. Um, we had a pretty cold winter this winter, right, in Denmark. Um, lots of sea ice around the coast. And actually, there were some really interesting pictures from our colleagues in Finland who, who saw that the ice actually froze in a lot of the macroalgae. And when this broke up, it just ripped them off completely. Um, and naturally, those get deposited uh, somewhere else. So there are all of these impacts. Um, and in fact, people tend to talk about you know, cold spells being actually quite good for things like seaweeds and, and you know, that they need them for their, for their reproduction. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, it goes both ways. And um, yeah, so, so I, I think it is, it's definitely a focus area. There's been more done on heat waves for sure. But uh, yeah, I think the key is to have, you know, uh, these sort of continuous measurements to try and, you know, capture everything. I felt it clicked. Um, OK, yeah, thanks for this talk. It was very nice. Um, if, you, if you look at those heat waves in coastal systems um, and the impact on the carbon stock, on the carbon capture, right, you would uh, assume, I think, a decrease of carbon capture in a way, right, as biodiversity would lower, you would assume. So what, what about other, would you, would you try and get a whole greenhouse gas budget? What would you expect? I mean, you could also look at nitrous oxide and methane, but also at DMS. Would you aim at this, and do you have any 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 idea of how that would look? So I have I have no plans to look at um, other greenhouse gases, but that could be an area for you to link in, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's very you're right. It's very relevant. Yeah, it is. Yes. Thanks a lot, Carl, for a great talk. Um, so it is very difficult to predict what is actually going to happen with these events. We have that we know they have a big impact, and to follow on some of the other questions, also my answer. So we can see, so we can measure online in real time benthic oxygen exchange rate with the predicated covariance. But clearly, we don't really know which parameters to look for. So what else do you envision looking at when you talk about having continuous measurement or online monitoring or mm -hmm. and so forth? What other parameters would you uh, look at, and, and how would you do you have any visions for how to capture that? Yeah, I think I think um, there are the sensors we require at least to capture the main events. So right, so if we think about heat waves, that's obviously temperature. Um, if we think about storms, you know, we could we we, we should definitely use uh, turbidity sensors, for instance. Uh, but I think it's also really useful to have um, weather stations on land to look at, you know, wind speeds, winds direct, wind direction, because it is context dependent, right? If you have a bay, it's not only going to be uh, it's it's only going to be in influenced by certain wind directions. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, you would need a, a sensor, you know, not, numerous sensors to to try to to capture this and. Um, Perhaps even thinking about the broader scale, you know, thinking about uh, satellites and uh, and other uh, techniques to to kind of look at these processes on a larger scale as well. Yeah, I was specifically thinking about biodiversity. How do you quantify? All oh, right. Yeah. The yeah. So the the question is, how do you how do you map uh, quantify the biodiversity? Uh, I think yeah. So I mentioned drones, and uh, that's one area to get the, that's one way to get the spatial extent, but it's 
only, at the moment at least, it's only sort of presence and absence, right? And often what we want to have more detail. So I think, you know, traditional uh, surveys, um, getting our feet wet, you know, diving is, is, is also going to be a complementary tool there, to, especially to get things like, you know, the biomass, um, shoe densities of seagrasses, for instance, and the animals uh, living on the seafloor as well and in association with, with these habitats. So, so in a way, it is, it is um, moving you know, towards new technologies, but it's also using established techniques, uh, but to reveal, hopefully, something new about uh, the coastal zones. I think uh, that was that. <laughs> so. Thank you. Well, uh, maybe I have one. If we have time, we have time. <laughs> 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 Don't begin to work here. I have one more question. One thing I'm, of course, particularly interested in is this export of cross habitat transport of carbon. So, partly within the most of habitats in the coastal realm, but also, as you mentioned, sort of going into the deep realm. Have you any considerations of how to tackle that, so to try to quantify to what extent is it really so that the coastal ocean? feed the sea or sustain uh, deep sea habitats and deep sea communities? Yeah, I think it's, 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 um, it's one of the key questions. Um, also within, within, you know, when, when people think about, you know, carbon sequestration and, uh, and all this, so it's another sort of sequestration pathway, if you like. But, but yeah, I'm also fascinated by this concept that what happens in the shallows affects you know the, the greatest depths of the oceans right so it's not it's not it's not just that immediate impact uh, I think there could be different approaches we've had uh, we've done some work uh, our, ourselves where we've um, you know by by quantify trying to capture trying to get the carbon flow pathways in the shallows you can at least estimate in theory how much is exported but I think these naturally be, need to be constrained better with studies at the other end, right, at, at, at the deep sea. So we need, to get, we need to get sediments from there. We need to analyze these sediments. And then uh, there are emerging techniques looking at um, even you know, pinpointing the contribution of specific species from the shallows to the carbon pool uh, in the deeper realm. Uh, but but clearly we need to we need to that that's that's also one one uh, research frontier I think is to figure out to try to constrain how much carbon yeah. is is entering the deep yeah. yeah there's some promising development about sequencing approaches for actually trying to quantify the the vectors transporting carbon into the deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll, um, I think I was supposed to close the session here and there are no more questions. Um, are there anything from the chat? There's nothing from the chat, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, yeah, exactly. So, uh, otherwise, I would suggest that you grab a small snack, uh, take it up to maybe to the roof terrace, and uh, can continue there chatting and, and discussing uh, various aspects, whatever you feel like. Good, so thanks again, guys. Thank you very much.